morning to everyone who I can see uh, attending at the BMA House in London. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, session, this panel discussion around preprint review. Uh, beyond the journal, I don't think I have to explain peer review to any of you uh, virtually or in person. It's a very important process as part of a scholarly publishing. Uh, many journals, of course, use uh, peer review to decide what to publish. Uh, and what not to publish. It is also a process that um, researchers attach great value to, and they spend a lot of time doing it. Um, there was an estimate published some months ago that suggested that researchers spend over 100 million hours a year doing peer review. Um, the reason why they spend so much time uh, on this endeavor is that they regard it as an important scholarly contribution, a contribution to their communities, but also as a process for quality control for research before it gets uh, disseminated, usually, again, traditionally in the form of a journal article. At the same time, we have been having many conversations recently around the potential weaknesses or challenges of peer review as it has traditionally operated within journals. Um, some have called it a um, black box, happens behind closed doors. We don't see so much as to what's happening, challenges around diversity and representation, who contributes peer reviews versus who globally contributes to research outputs. And importantly, we also don't have so much strong evidence as to whether it actually works as a quality control uh, mechanism or as a, as a way to help researchers improve scientific uh, output. So in parallel to all of these calls for change, improvement, innovation in peer review, what we are seeing is quite a few interesting experiments around um, preprint review. So as you all know, there's been a growth in the use of preprints for science dissemination, at least specifically in the life sciences. And with this, we are seeing groups and platforms and, and services appearing that what they do is they are coordinating reactions, comments, uh, even peer review similar to what journals do on preprints and posting them uh, publicly with the uh, preprints themselves. And obviously by virtue of preprints being freely available online, it means that also in principle, anyone can participate, whether it is coordinated uh, as an activity or just by individuals contributing themselves. So what we wanted to do uh, in this session is have a conversation around these two trends, calls for improving peer review, what's happening in the context of preprints, and see if those trends may converge in the future. Are there ways of making them more complementary of learning from, from each other as we try to improve peer review? Or perhaps preprint review is becoming too complex, fragmented, and wieldy to really thrive uh, in the coming years. So we wanted to explore all of that with our three speakers. Um, but I also wanted to mention before we start that we, we are happy to introduce questions at any point. So if you are um, uh, watching us on the platform, please post any comments, reactions, questions on the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that. And obviously in person as well, please feel free to ask questions and we'll do our best to introduce as many as possible during the session. Okay, so with that, we're going to dive right in. I wanted to start with the first question for our three speakers. Uh, which is, again, there's been calls for improving, changing, making peer review better. Uh, you know, is preprint review one answer to this? And how 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 would that be? So maybe I'm going to ask uh, Bodo to get us started. What do you think? Hi. Yeah, thank you, Iracha, for uh, including me on this panel. And um, I'm really excited to talk about preprint uh, peer review because it's really, it's become sort of um, clear to us at HHMI that preprint peer review is really a mechanism that could address uh, many of the shortcomings that we we think um, bedevil um, journal peer review, um, and, and in particular, um, we, we know of course preprints can be shared faster, cheaper, and uh, earlier than than journal articles. But I think there is another advantage of preprints that is often overlooked. Preprint servers don't have a journal impact factor. And, and that makes them independent of this um, assessment tool that we often use in, in academia. And that advantage also translates to preprint um, peer review. It, it allows preprint peer review to be really focusing on the science, just like the preprint. Uh, it can only be evaluated based on the science, not on the journal that it's published in. And, and that really is a huge advantage. To us, a big shortcoming of journal peer review is 
that it is structured as a consultancy service. And so peer reviewers always have to keep in mind, oh, I'm writing, I'm peer reviewing this article, but I need to do it in such a way that the editor can make a decision, thumbs up, thumbs down. And to us, that means it, 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 sort, of, it sort of mixes two things. And we, we think peer review done by experts in the field should focus on the science. Editors can use that information to make their decisions for sure, but this, the peer review itself should focus on the science. And preprint peer review can, um, can really do that. And so that, that's why we have decided we want to really promote preprint peer review over the coming years. So I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you so much, Bodo. So I think I'm going to go now next to Gauri again as a researcher's perspective on this. What, what do you think? Yeah, um, I quite like uh, the ideas that Bodo uh, has put down. I, I, I fully agree. I'm also a, a, a supporter, I think, of preprint uh, reviewing for, well, many, many reasons, some of them covered uh, by Bodo. I do think that um, one of the points that for me is an added benefit is that it really opens up this peer review process. And of course, there are benefits and downsides to this. Uh, but I think one of the challenges um, that I face as an editorial board member sometimes is finding appropriate peer reviewers. Uh, and I know that this is uh, an issue that is not an isolated problem in trying to find appropriate journal peer reviewers with the right expertise. Uh, and I think that preprints is one way of overcoming this. And of course, there will be downsides as with everything, but you have a wider catchment um, and by by default, it is possible that your research can be reviewed by the right experts for many part of the world. Um, and you're not just restricted to a database uh, which you may use to try to find appropriate reviewers. So that for me, from the researcher's perspective, from an editorial board member on a journal is one of the biggest advantages of um, the open peer review, the preprint uh, uh, peer reviewing of preprints. However, I think we need to also keep in mind that in, in my mind, some of the more severe downsides would be um, you know, harassment issues. We've seen that happening on social media. So I do think that we also need to step up you know, the ability to protect uh, the, and to focus, as Bodo said, on the science. Uh, and not on the person or the researcher or the institution. So I do think that there needs to be, you know, some kind of a consensus and understanding that there will be some uh, detrimental side effects and that we need to also take that into, into account. Thank you so much, Gary. So I'm gonna move on now to Nonia in her role as, um, as an editor. What, what do you think? How, are these complementary? What are the positives, the downsides? Oh, you're muted, Nani. First of all, thanks, Irache, for the invitation to be here in such great company. I'm also excited to talk about preprint peer review. I have to say, of course, among the whole ecosystem of um, life science publishing, uh, PLOS is on the quite preprint friendly side and therefore um, very proximal to, to the topic of discussion. And uh, so I don't know you know, we probably should would have a wider conversation with other uh, editors, publishers, because I do think that um, there needs to be a working together if this is going to really take off. Um, I I agree that um, that a lot of issues with peer review can be overcome if we move the scientific assessment to the preprint, um, as Vodo was saying. Um, and I, for me, as a journal editor, and also touching a little bit on what Gary was saying, it's the sustainability of the process. Peer review is not such an old uh, process, and it was invented at a time when there was a lot less research going on, or at least being published. I mean, I think there has been research, you know, that was under the radar, but... Um, uh, <clears throat> it was more sustainable because there were uh, less papers to be assessed. Uh, the, the volume of scientific publication is increasing incredibly and, um, and every paper is on average, um, I mean, this is a relatively old stack, but is on average peer reviewed in three different places before it gets published. Uh, and I think this is just a wasted community effort and it leads to in the end, the paper maybe being assessed 
by people who are not so proximal to the science it is reporting. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, having one scientific assessment of the research product and then using this um, to, to, um, to find a journal, let's say, to publish in, uh, would be a way of overcoming this. Um, I think there, you know, and probably we're going to talk about these issues, there, there would need to be a structuring. I mean, one of the issues I see is that, um, and PLOS has done experiments trying to use preprint comments in informing the peer review process, that this really doesn't very much work. Most of the papers have no comments. The ones that have comments are often, you know, very laudatory one or two liners. Um, so there should be, there needs to be a structuring of the peer review process wherever it is to take place to ensure that appropriate expertise has evaluated the paper um, and, and that there, there are comments there that are critical assessment of the, of the research. But indeed, I mean, I think it would be a step in the right direction to move toward a model where, where peer review is done on the preprint. Great, thank you. So I, I think I wanted to follow up on, on a couple of the items that you, you've already touched on. Um, I think Gauri's comment about the potential risk um, of, again, harassment or, you know, what are the ramifications if I expose myself publicly in an open forum is, is really an important one and something that I often think about because I used to work as an editor and all of these issues about finding reviewers. It's so tricky to find the right reviewers. We've been discussing that. Um, so how can we really, without the framework of a journal, encourage this participation in an open forum where both the preprint authors and the reviewers are exposing themselves to potential criticism on their work, on their expertise, if they are commenting, etc. Or I guess, in other words, what are the incentives or the systems that we need to put in place to encourage that participation? So I, I think I'll go to Gauri, given as you mentioned this, and again, from the perspective of the results of first, and, and then maybe Bodo. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not sure about what kind of incentives we need to put in place, but I do think that there needs to be a growing awareness and understanding that this is, as, as Nonia has said, a step in the right direction. So I think as a community, we need to, you know, sort of cultivate this practice that open peer review should be safe and that it should be part of the research culture. So I think that, you know, the, um, the ideas uh, that, I, that I mentioned, well, uh, it's not an idea, but it, 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 is, it does in fact happen. We've, seen, we've witnessed it, um, you know, magnified in, in COVID uh, where there is bullying and harassment happening, where, you know, the attacks, are, are not uh, are person specific and not on the science. And I think that for me, this is really speaking to the research culture. Uh, and I believe that there, uh, there is uh, room uh, for improvement in terms of, you know, peer review um, being seen as uh, the cornerstone of good science. And um, that, that when we look at peer review as being critical, to evaluating the research, to safeguarding research quality. And of course, the journal, you know, within uh, performing peer review within the journal context is in a way safeguarding um, this peer review process. So it has its upsides and downsides, as we just discussed, it leads to it being a black box. But the upside of it is that there is sort of a protection framework around this. But I believe strongly that it's got to do with the research culture in which we operate in, that review, uh, reviewers and researchers are often afraid to actually have open peer review. And I think that when we start working on changing the idea around peer review, that it is the cornerstone of good science, that that could help. Um, in changing the mindset and the perspective. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that respectful critique, I believe, is important. It is a skill, I tend to believe, um, and I tend to look at it um, as a skill that researchers also need to be taught. Um, so we do need to understand how to respectfully critique each other's work. Uh, and as we move into more of a transparent and open domain, you know, skills like this become increasingly important. Thank you so much, Gary. Important, all of this discussion about cultural change that is always so hard and takes so much time. But any thoughts on, again, how can we increase participation, build incentives around this type of activity? Yeah, on, um, on the topic of incentives, how do, we, how do we motivate scientists to participate? I'd say 
Um, we need to recognize uh, preprints and preprint review more in our research assessment. Um, and one way that we think this could be done is if we change what we ask for when people cite articles. You know, right now it's absolutely common practice, and I mean, to the exclusion of others, that people cite journal articles. But there's nothing that stops us from saying when you cite something, cite the preprint. Cite the peer reviews, cite the revised articles. I mean, it can, of course, be a journal article, but it doesn't have to be. Um, when, you, when you just want to have something that is peer reviewed, it's sufficient if you say, here's the preprint, here are the peer reviews, here are the revisions. That is encompassing the, the peer review as we know it. Yeah? So that if we do it that way, we could maybe incentivize people to go this route. Okay, this is valued by my funder, by my research institution. Let, let, me, let me try it out. And I think that also helps to, um, to incentivize people to be respectful, because if, if a peer review appears under one's name, for example, then you know, that can be, um, can be um, reviewed. The second part, uh, answer here is, is something that goes along with what Nunia said uh, about structuring, um, structuring the peer review. I mean, just because we move things to, to a peer review to preprints, I don't think that means that we shouldn't involve editors in the process. I, I, I actually think editors can still play a, a, a really important role in making sure that the process is respectful and making, but it, the role of editors would however shift. It wouldn't anymore be a gatekeeper function that, whose critical role is thumbs up, thumbs down, but it would be more of a, of a, of a chaperone in some ways, a moderator who brings in voices and makes sure that other voices are heard. So, so I think editors can actually play an important role and I'm sure editors already feel that that's what they are often doing. And that's what, that's what is the most interesting and fun role that editors are currently doing. And so I feel like let's make that the, the, let's make that the central part of their role. Um, and, and I think we would all benefit from that. So that's, that's the two things. I totally agree. Structuring and incentivizing um, can go a long way here. Thank you so much. Well, Nani, I just wonder if you wanted to add anything to this comment. I wanted to add, maybe this will be controversial, but, um, uh, you know, it, and it's also very field dependent, but I don't know. I mean, perhaps we should decouple the, the preprint review from the double open review, right? Um, the way, you know, most platforms that are that are now currently doing, um, you know, very, very well in the preprint peer review space don't necessarily post the names of the reviewers. And, um, and I think, if we want a future where we're moving fast toward this kind of review, because there, you know, there are two culture changes here that need to happen. One is to review -re reprints, and the other one is to be double open and, and yet be a critical and be respectful. And um, so I think if we if we package too much, the risk for the for the initial takers is too high. Uh, to to really jump the hurdle, right? So if you really are engaging in preprint peer review with uncertain incentives, and on top of that, exposing yourself to to backlash, I think you know we might think of going stepwise. It's not I'm opposed to double open peer review, although I have you know in my experience as the editor, so inside the black box, I will say that that because there is not this culture of critical thinking, open reviews tend to be much more lenient. Whether this is good or bad, you know, it's a matter of debate, but I don't think that people feel as free to be critical, even in, you know, in, in, the, in the analytical thinking way, not, not, um, not in the destructive way, when they feel there might be retribution. Um, and people are very happy to, to sign their reports or disclose their names at the end of the process when a paper will be published. But if they're negative about a paper, they are much less so. Willing. Thank you so much for all of those thoughts and comments. I think we have a question from someone in London, uh, from Rick Anderson. Rick, would you like to post the question live? Yes. Uh, is the mic working? 
Yep. Yes, we can hear uh, you. So I'm, I'm, I have a question that goes back to uh, Bodo's initial statement. I, I came away from that with the impression, Bodo, that you feel that uh, preprint review will focus on the science. And I, I took away, maybe correctly and maybe not, the implication that you feel that traditional peer review maybe doesn't focus on the science. Did I understand you correctly? And if so, why do you believe that? I certainly think that is um, that that is possible because traditional peer review is structured as an advice to journals, and so it muddies the water that the peer reviewers are not just focusing on the science. And some peer reviewers do that, but some peer reviewers don't do that. And even if you try to focus on the science as a peer reviewer, you always have in the back of your head that this peer review must be useful for an editor. You're doing it for an editor to make a decision, and therefore you are shaping what you are saying in the context of somebody needs to make a thumbs up, thumbs down decision. It really changes how you structure peer review. And I think we, what we need to do is we need to separate the two. The peer reviewers should really entirely focus on the science, not think about suitability for a journal. That would also allow it to be um, more transparent. I mean, I agree with what Nanya said about anonymity, I, but, but the, the scientific evaluation should be coming out. There shouldn't be anything in the peer review that, that, that says this paper isn't interesting enough for Journal X. And the truth is that is often in a peer review included. Uh, that part needs to be, uh, that makes it much more constructive and scientists, uh, authors would be happier to see a critique that is focusing on the science to be published. So I, I do think the current uh, traditional journal peer review muddies the water um, and, and doesn't exact doesn't um, focus on the science all the time. It's you know many people do it that, the right way, but it, it's not because it's structured as a consultancy service. There is the possibility that it doesn't just focus on the science. Thanks so much, Bodo and Rick, for that question. I believe there may be another comment or question from London. So if the person would like to ask the question with the microphone, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Nico Gontra of uh, Osmanthus Consulting Limited. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time with digital science in Clarivate and worked with um, Publons for years. And so I, I really like the idea of preprints and, and open peer review, but I've always felt like there needed to be a driver Bodo, your point about having editors involved is could be a potential driver. What I'm what I'd like to ask, and maybe I direct it at Nonia since you're actually at a publisher, is do you think you could we could get publishers to allocate editors to give at like roving editors who just focus on looking at preprints and so are they commit they're 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 carrying out a community service for a particular discipline, particular um, area of papers. At the same time, they're also scouting for, they're, they're performing a role of uh, unofficial content acquisition because they can be alert to up and coming authors, et cetera. I think there's a win-win there, but I don't know in terms of resource allocation, like how many staff a publisher could commit to that and what you'd need to give this whole, this way of conducting peer review and, and validating uh, preprints the momentum it needs. Any comment from here or any publishers in the room would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I I don't see that being very viable in terms of resource allocation and also very different ways of working and bars and processes. Um, I think that what would work better is if the organization of the peer review was done at the preprint server level, right? So people that are directly at the preprint server organizing the peer review, because editors at journals, it is a fact that now they do um, survey preprint servers and call in papers from preprint servers already, but the resources that, that go, uh, uh, substantial amount of editorial time goes, as Gary was saying, um, to managing the peer review and finding reviewers and et cetera. And so I think publishers would find it um, you know, difficult to justify spending that amount of resource on papers that are not ultimately going to be published in their journals or with their publisher. 
Right, thank you so much, Noni, and thank you for um, the person in the audience. Um, I also wanted to ask the speakers for their views on, on, on something that, again, coming back to this participation element, and we've talked a little bit about the incentives for researchers to participate in this, but I just wonder if one of the potential future scenarios that we may see, again, depending on how much structure and moderation and coordination there is around preprints, is whether we may end up trying to fix a problem around diversity by introducing a different one, where if we don't have the editor who essentially is tasked with finding room for every paper that crosses their desk and decide to put through through peer review, in the preprint space, we may end up just seeing comments for, say, prestigious institutions or leaders in the field and no reactions on some other papers. So essentially, is this something that we should accept as perhaps the future as well in terms of seeing accepting that some papers may be deemed as more interesting or you know worthy of commenting versus others? Is that a problem? Or should we actually see peer reviews evolving as essentially we don't need to have the same amount of reviews, the same extent of review for every paper? Um, so I want to ask the speakers for their thoughts on this. Maybe Gauri, starting from you, what are your thoughts? Is this a problem or actually is just the future? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, uh, issue that you raise. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to gather my thoughts actually as you were posing this question, and I'm trying to recall a recent study that I uh, read on from the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which uh, basically said that even within the published record. Um, uh, in terms of citations, at least, there is a clear demarcation between um, race and ethnicity uh, of authors and citations. Uh, and we all know already uh, what I'm going to say next, you know, that this uh, demarcation obviously uh, ends up with a certain group, um, mainly the minority groups, female ethnic minorities, and these papers being less cited. So that was a very interesting publication that came out recently in February from the Proceedings of the National Academy of science. And if that is already happening uh, in terms of citations within the publication record, I think you pose a very interesting and relevant question in terms of, you know, um, when we move to peer review in an open platform of preprints, whether we will see, you know, a sort of replication of this uh, in terms of certain types of uh, authors receiving more comments and more activity around uh, those preprints than, uh, than other topics, other regional areas, or even other types of authors. I think it's, it's, it's a very legitimate question. I don't know uh, whether this uh, would become a problem, but it does seem that if that is already um, an issue that we need to be aware of in terms of uh, the publication record and citations, then it makes sense to me that this would be something that we need to keep um, our hand on the pulse, uh, so to speak. I'm not quite sure how we would need to address that or what would be ways. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pass that over to some of the uh, the other mm -hmm. panelists uh, while I deliberate on this very mm -hmm. challenging question you've asked. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to take your cue. Maybe Bodo, any thoughts on this? Does it matter? I mean, maybe do we yeah. need the same review for every paper? I, so I, I think this is both a big opportunity and a big challenge. I think Nanya brought up at the beginning at the beginning that the number of research articles are is growing exponentially, and 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 that we have already this huge problem of identifying peer reviewers for mm -hmm. for for these articles. I mean, that's clearly an issue that we are, haven't solved at all. So I think it makes a lot of sense to say not every article needs the same de degree of peer review. If you have a, I mean. I don't know what percentage of articles are never cited. I mean, I hope they are still being re read. Yeah, but but we, you could imagine if if they if an article is just read by the ten experts in the world that really need that information, they they are experts already. They can evaluate by themselves. Is this rigorous science or not? Now, ideally, they would do more of what Nonya said is, is missing. They would do some commenting and say this this works at advertise. But I mean. We don't need to peer review these articles necessarily formally. Yeah, an informal review would, uh, by the experts who use it, would suffice. Yeah, and then we can focus the 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 the, the peer review resources on those articles that have much broader impact 
impact beyond the, uh, the experts that understand the science yeah so i think that is the opportunity the challenge is of course that in the in today's world that could mean that certain articles that deserve much more attention are, are not getting it for reasons that have to do with bias or with you know with other things and and in that i the only answer for that i mean i don't i don't know a good answer for that i just don't think we can solve it with the current system we need to move into this new system into this brave new world of preprint review and then figure it out and one way to do it would be to say well let's continue to have some editors that keep an eye on this and make sure that we are not ignoring some of the um um, um the articles that that seem interesting i mean that could be one way to have to have these uh editors that, that are, again as i said earlier not gatekeepers but they are making sure that that we are looking at the literature uh, of preprints in a in a more inclusive way thank you so much Ola. Noni, any thoughts on this again from your perspective you, you, you do look for reviews for the papers that you choose so how i mean i think we have more questions than answers at this point but it, yeah. it's also fine i think it's so i i see both things um and i i'm extremely worried about a future that is very top down looking for interesting preprints you know there's other conversations where perhaps people shouldn't submit to journals editors should come fish and already it's happening that the the preprints from the top labs are getting you know um all kinds of uh interest from many journals at the same time and then a lot of people are not getting any and as an editor it's always been really reassuring that because you read everything that comes across your desk even when i was working at nature i published things from people that i didn't know and and were not extremely well known in the field um but if you are looking for preprints the easy way is to is to go to people you trust you know labs that seem to be doing exciting work so i think the potential of increasing the bias even further is quite large having said this i also think that perhaps not everything needs to be peer-reviewed i mean i agree with bodo there i think there are already i don't ask me about the details but there are already studies that say that most papers have more authors than readers and most papers are read only by machines i mean if you see however many index journals exist uh, you know our kind of ecosystem is the tip of an ice a huge iceberg um but then would we be just moving the gatekeeping one step forward you know backwards like to an earlier part of the process if there is an editor or whomever or whatever you want to call it deciding this preprint deserves peer review and this print doesn't deserve it isn't that gatekeeping anyway because you know then in the future this will be a peer-reviewed preprint versus a non-peer-reviewed preprint and so instead of publishing in nature cell or science it will be whether your preprint has peer reviews um so i worry that we are just moving the the needle in creating the same problem somewhere else perhaps something very important to 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 keep in mind of course again we don't want to be trying to fix problems by just recreating them in a in a different space in a different shape um i wanted to ask another uh, question in relation to disciplinary cultures both around publication and, and review um i also want to be very mindful about my own blind spots i come from a biomedical background as i think many of the speakers do as well um but i think it's been interesting to observe how the preprint review initiatives ha have been growing as preprinting grew in the life sciences but of course there is a long tradition of using preprints in physics so in the social sciences and less tradition of doing this reviewing along with the preprints um so i just wonder if you could share a few thoughts as to again how can we what, what do we expect to see across disciplines is this something that essentially biomedical scientists will adopt because for whatever reason they are more keen on open peer review for example on, or they want to bring more change or actually are we going to see different disciplines adopting this what the trends may be do we need to account for again that there are different cultures there is much more double anonymized review in the social sciences for example than in biology so is this something that we need to be watching for the future and if so how, how can we factor it in um gauri any thoughts 
Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, I fall on the same side of uh, the curve as you uh, coming from the life uh, sciences. Um, so there is in, indeed, I think that the tr tradition um, of preprints and preprint surfers being around, as you correctly pointed out, physics and the natural sciences, they have been there much longer than uh than, uh, than for the life and biomedical sciences. However, I think it's an interesting point, and I don't know this at the back of my hand, um, whether the commenting aspect, so the peer reviewing of the preprint, is that as active as you know the posting of preprints in these other disciplines? This is something that I, I am not sure of. I do know that COVID preprints, at least within the life and biomedical sciences, received extensive commenting. And there have been studies which have looked at other non-COVID preprints within the life and biomedical sciences and peer reviewing of these kinds of preprints, even within this discipline, are not. The uptake on the comment field is quite low, in fact, low to very low. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure whether, um, I think there are two things here that we're discussing. One is the posting of the preprint. Uh, and my understanding is that there is a longer tradition in other disciplines, such as the natural sciences. Uh, the commenting or the peer reviewing of the preprint uh, again, I'm I'm not sure whether this will be uh, this is this also has a long-standing tradition or not in the natural sciences. I'm I can't speak for that field. I'm, I'm not from that field, but within what I've observed for the life sciences, there is a clear you know difference again uh, that more high-profile studies, uh, such as during the COVID pandemic, these preprints receiving more comments. Um, in the form of peer review comments than non-high-profile um, studies. Um, so I, I do think that the tradition of peer-reviewing preprints itself is probably quite new and different from this, the posting of the preprint. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure whether the, the peer-reviewing is um, something that is happening extensively and is active in other disciplines. I, I would tend to think, uh, and you'd have to, the rest of the panelists, or maybe even in the room, people from these other disciplines would have to correct me. I would tend to think that the peer reviewing is probably still quite a new concept, uh, generally, um, that the research community is opening itself up to. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, any thoughts about, again, these nuances across disciplines and in how they approach preprint review or peer review in general? Yeah, I um, I would say that. I mean, first of all, I think it's it's not it's not bad if there is a, a adoption at different speed. We can innovate in in certain fields that adopt faster, and clearly there are differences in culture and there are differences in need. Um, what what needs to be part of the peer review and 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 whether that lends itself well for preprint mm. peer review. So I think. I think uh, um, adoption at various rates is something that we should um, that we should expect and welcome. Um, I also, uh, it's, I mean, fundamentally, I think preprint peer review is something that I mean, I I don't really see why it shouldn't work uh, across many different disciplines. But as I said, I expect that it would be adopted at various speeds. I do see differences in in um, in. In when a preprint should be posted, what kind of checks preprints need to undergo before they get posted? Because you could imagine if something is of medic, you know, if, if a preprint has impact on medical practice, then there should be some higher bar before that gets released on a preprint server than something that is just sort of basic science. Um, so anything that has impact on direct impact on human behavior, I think there needs to be a, a higher bar on, on the on the checks before something gets posted. Um, but so so that is clearly discipline specific. I'm, I'm, I've, I've left I've, I've less ideas exactly what the what those discipline specific aspects are for preprint peer review. Yeah, very important the filtering mechanism as well that yeah. we didn't necessarily touch on. But um, yeah. I believe there is a question from the audience. So, uh, Rick, if you're ready, are you essentially? Yeah. Please go ahead. Feel free to pose the question for the speakers. Shall I go ahead? Yes. Anthony, yes, please. Anthony Watkinson, Cyber oh, Research. Thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, it's a factual point. 
about the disciplines, other disciplines outside the life sciences. Just remember, um, physics, high level and particle physics, sorry, particle physics and, and some other areas in physics, not condensed matter physics, for example, was seen as unique because nobody apart from the um, author, the author, author community was the same as the reader community. That was the argument why they had done so well for many years, archive and so forth. Now, the thing is, obviously, in the life sciences, it's very, very recent. If you remember, it used to be forbidden to, to expose your work before you had it in a, in a, submitted to a journal, until very, very recently. Now, it's quite new, uh, working on early career researchers, as I do, who tend to be rather conservative about such matters, they have only just realized how it's interesting, preprint half of visibility in, in the life sciences, and in medicine, of course, it's, uh, and med medical sciences. Uh, the people in chemistry are just beginning to discover this, but they many, most of them hadn't put a, in a preprint yet. And the same thing goes for most of the social sciences. Many of them just didn't recognize preprints. Uh, in psychology, for example, the psychologists were not happy with the idea of preprints still. And just didn't recognize the, the, visible, the, the actual preprint servers available to them. Okay, just a factual point. Thank you so much for, for that addition. I think it's important to hear that. Um, I realize we have only two minutes left, so I wanted to, uh, I guess, take my prerogative as chair <laughs> um, to ask one last uh, question to the speakers. And again, we only have around one minute and a half, so I'll ask you so just a sentence or two each. I wanted to round up with some kind of forward thinking thoughts. Um, so I'll ask each of you if you can give us again one, two sentences as to what you think your vision is for what the trends will be about preprint, uh, sorry, peer review outside the, the journals, preprint review in the, in the window of the next five years. So, uh, Nonia. Um, so I think that uh, there will be an increase. But I'm not sure. I think we are in the sweet spot to try to as we were talking about at the beginning, incentivize these practices to really make a huge culture change that will be lasting. I think we, we are right now at a situation where it can become fragmentary and, and more ad hoc. Um, but there is interest, and I, you know, applause works with three organizations that, uh, that do preprint peer review, and um, author, the author experience is generally very good. So I do think there's a future, but I think we have to, you know, the, the, the players involved, the stakeholders and the interested people in driving this change, um, we really have our work cut out for us to ensure there's a momentum here rather than a dispersion, let's say. Thanks, Nonia. Uh, Gauri, one sentence was the future, I guess, in the next five years. One sentence, gosh, uh, I mean, I heard today a lot in our discussion today about the need for some sort of a governance structure. Um, so I really do think, you know, given that we've just discussed that there is already a, a escalation in the number uh, or quantity of articles uh, and now a translation into preprints, I think in the next five years, we would need to really, you know, think about what kind of governance structure do we need at the risk of not replicating again, mm -hmm. you know, what is happening in the journals, but some form of a governance structure would be needed, particularly if we are facing again a crisis or a similar crisis crisis is what we have been facing, where there's urgency for research, research is being shared faster. Uh, I think that there will be a need for uh, a structured way uh, of governing the quality of these preprints that are coming out. Thanks, Gary. Well, the final sentence, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, um, I think over the next five years, and that's really what I'm excited about, over the next five years, we will see a lot of innovation and experimentation in peer review. Um, and that includes experimentation with preprint peer review. Uh, we will not just complain about what is wrong with peer review. We will try things out. Some things will fail and some things will work well. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's what I predict. Thanks, Gary. Well, 
Fantastic. Uh, lesson, lesson, lesson learned from the failures as well. Thank you so much. We are, we are the time. So thank you to all our speakers, the audience, both virtually and in the room, uh, everyone for their comments and questions. It's been a great discussion. I'm sure we'll have many more discussions around this in the future. Thank you for taking part. And a reminder that I believe the next item now in the program is the final uh, session for the workshops. So again, uh, head to either the physical room at the BMA house or to the virtual uh, room for the final discussion on the workshops. And again, thank you so much and uh, have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>